Hey, everybody. Hey, y'all. It's Brian and Julie here. Welcome to another night of Live at Five. Da, da, da. Thanks for joining <laughs> us. Uh, tonight we have a special guest, a uh, friend, and author and pioneer in the kingdom. All around cool dude. Dave Hayes. <laughs> Paul also, Man, extraordinary. Yeah. also known as Praying Medic. And uh, as you know, uh, or as you should know, Dave's the author of at least 11 books at this point. And I think he's probably surpassed that, or at least it's in the editing stage, uh, getting ready to go out. But uh, Dave has been a guest on Sid Ross at Supernatural. So some of you may have already been blessed with seeing him there. And uh, he's got, he's the author of the, uh, what I like to call the Made Simple series. Uh, he has numerous books, uh, such as uh, Traveling in the Spirit Made Simple, Seeing in the Spirit Made Simple, Hearing God's Voice Made Simple, and Divine Healing Made Simple, along with uh, some really interesting books, his uh, Craziest Adventures in God, Volume 1 and 2, uh, along with other ones. Dave, it's such a pleasure to have you joining us tonight. We want to welcome you to Live at Five. No, it is. If, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was going to ask Suzanne if we're still echoing. She said echoing. Okay. So. Well, we should be okay. Okay. No echo? Well, it no, is, we uh, it's, it's a great, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it really is. And I thank you guys for having me on. Hang on. It's, it's, a great, it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's my secondary device talking. <laughs> I see Kazuko is on here. Yeah. Hi, hey, Mimi. Mimi. It's a pleasure Mimi. to see you. Our Welcome sister. to Japan. And Amy Rice Workman. Hi, Hi. Amy. That's my cousin. It's good to see you. So, Dave, uh, you've done a lot of amazing things uh, and having great effect in the kingdom that we really appreciate. And, uh, of course, Julie and I personally, we enjoy the relationship and the fellowship with you above all things. But uh, for our viewing audience, we know that not too long ago, uh, it really wasn't that way. Uh, you you weren't uh, walking in the kingdom. I, I, I believe you were a, a self-avowed atheist. Uh, so I'm wondering, where did all this begin for you? Well, that is an interesting question. That is a long story. Um, you know, I, I had uh, kind of let my ship run aground years ago, and I, I became filled with pride and arrogance. And, you know, I, I wasn't a Christian. In fact, I mocked Christians. I didn't believe in God at all. Didn't it, I was just a total skeptic and a Darwinist and an atheist. And um, uh, some friends recommended that I read a book called Left Behind. Um, I read the book. It literally scared the hell out of me. And uh, that sent me on my path to finding God. I did find him, or he found me. And my life has never been the same since then. And I, I went to just a basic Bible teaching church for about eight years. I learned the Bible really well, but I didn't learn anything about um, the supernatural, didn't learn about miracles or healing. And it was... Uh, a time where God was kind of just going through my life and sorting out some different things. I, I had a very difficult time from 2000 when I became a believer to 2007 when I got kicked out of my first church. Um, I, you know, I lost my job, lost my wife, lost my kids, got divorced, um, lost my house. I, I lost a lot of different things. And it was a, it was a refining process for me. Um, God was doing a lot of different things in me that needed to change. Then in 2007 and 2008, 
things really began to change. I got, my mind got kind of outside the box. I started having dreams. Um, I started learning about healing and prophecy and things of that nature. So it's been kind of a wild ride for the last, uh, I would say, 10 years, nine or 10 years. Okay. Um, and it just gets wilder and wilder the longer we go. Awesome. That's really amazing. And I know it's been quite a journey for you. Uh, I believe that uh, sometime back, you had a turning point, And I believe the turning point for you is one that we still struggle with in Western cultures. And what I'm referring to, and what I'd like you to touch on a bit, is God began to visit you in the nighttime in dreams and began to share with you and put you in a direction that uh, has probably been uh, the, the meat or the foundation for a number of the books that you've done. Uh, would you like to share about that a bit? Sure, I would. Um, it That has been part of the wild ride. Um, you know, very early on in 2008, it was actually August 8th of 2008, I had my first dream in probably 25 years. I just really didn't have dreams as an adult. I think the last dreams that I had prior to that were probably when I was 20 or 21. And but by the time I was 46, I was ready for some more dreams. So... <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I had this dream where God appeared to me in the dream and he said, I want you to pray for your patients and I'm, and when you do, I'm going to heal them. So I didn't know anything about healing, didn't know about miracles. Um, it, it took me a while to wrap my mind around what did that look like? How do you get people healed? And what happened then, I didn't know this was going to happen at the time, but that was the first dream about healing. Since then, I've had over 400 different dreams about healing, deliverance, miracles, things of that nature, where God has revealed to me strategies, keys, things that I didn't understand. Um, good example is, gosh, probably three or four years ago, and I was working on the ambulance and I was trying to, transporting a lot of people who were depressed and suicidal, bipolar, schizophrenic, things of that nature. And I had seen a lot of people physically healed, but I wasn't seeing anyone, you know, healed of uh, mental illness or, or anything of that nature. So I asked God, look, I know you want these people healed. What are the keys? How do we get people healed of emotional uh, trauma and mental illness? And <laughs> that night um, I had a dream and it was a short dream. And in the dream, God basically said, emotional, uh, what he said was, mental illness is healed through love. That was wow. the dream. Wow. And, okay, so when you get a dream like that, you think, oh, that's great. Praise God. No, I was pretty angry, actually, <laughs> because, <laughs> because I was thinking there has to be more to it. There has to be some steps. There has to be like, you know, some bullet points. You have to do this and then you have to do that and this and that and the other thing. And I was looking for a little shopping list of things that we could do to get these people healed. And then God says, no, it's just love. Just love them, you know. So I didn't like that very much because I'm not the most loving person in the world. Um, but the interesting thing about that revelation that God gave me is uh, loving people out of mental illness, out of emotional trauma. There are some steps to it, but, but he's been showing me over the last, I don't know, couple of years that there is a process involved. There is a yes. process where we get, find these people and we go through a series of questions and ask them, okay, so when did your symptoms begin? When did you start feeling this way about yourself? When did you start hating yourself? Uh, what age were you? And we walk through the process of finding altars and frag soul fragments. And we find these wounded little children inside of them. And we introduce them to Jesus. 
and Jesus cool. brings them uh, healing of their emotional trauma. And he heals the wounds and he heals the pain. He takes away the shame and the self-hatred. So there is a dynamic, but it's all, it's, it's all love. It's Jesus loving them. It's Jesus showing them who he really is. It's us loving them and showing them that we love them, that we care about them, that they're not, you know, a lot of people suffer from rejection. Um, yeah. If I, when I'm praying for people, you know, if I go to, when I go to a school and I teach and I'm just praying over people, I see rejection on people more than anything else. There's yeah. so many people who live with rejection and God wants to heal that. He wants us to be healed of rejection. He wants to know that he, not only does he accept us, but he wants them to know that we believers accept them. See, a lot yeah. of people suffer rejection because they've been rejected by parents, rejected by friends, rejected in school, and rejected in the church. So, yeah. you know, when you get rejected over and over again, it makes a big impact on your, on your life, on your heart, on your soul. And people grow up thinking, well, I'm no good. Nobody accepts me. Uh, I, I'm just not going to ever fit anyone's, you know, criteria. And that's how I am. So God wants to heal things like that. And how he does it is he, Jesus goes in. Well, my process typically is I will, you know, ask the person, what is the strongest negative uh, memory that you have from your entire life? Just yeah. pick out a really horrible memory. When you think about it, it brings up negative emotions. Just think about that memory. Um, they, they come up with a memory of some abuse or rejection that they've suffered during their life. I walk them through a little process where <clears throat> they identify what emotion they're feeling. And uh, I ask them to give that emotion to Jesus. I have them ask Jesus to heal the wound in their soul and then just tell Jesus, Hey, I receive your healing. Now that is a really simple, um, process. It's, it can get more involved depending on what's going on. Um, some people, when you work with them, they will actually see a wounded version of them when they were four or five or six or eight years old, they'll see a, a wounded child who is angry about some punishment that they received or who, who has been, you know, tortured or who has been abused. And if, if they see this wounded part of their soul at that age, we then have Jesus meet with that part of their soul. He meets with them. If that wounded part of the soul trusts Jesus, he can then deal with their emotional trauma. He can take away the pain. He can sometimes take away the memories. And he works to help, you know, integrate and heal that part of their soul. Um, the dynamic of how this works, I just find it fascinating. I find it fascinating listening to people talk about this inner world that most of us are not aware of. Unless yeah. you've suffered severe trauma, then you become aware of the inner world. But this inner world is very real. It, for people who have especially severe trauma, multiple personalities, or DID, this inner world is a is a world of wounded children and wounded parts of their soul and the personalities. And when, when you start reading these stories and talking to these people, it is just, to me, it's fascinating how Jesus is able to go in there and meet with these different personalities and meet with the wounded parts of the soul and heal them. Um, that has become a, a major subject of interest for me. And I'm working on a book on a longer book on emotional healing. And uh, that's going to be the subject of actually my novels that I'm working on. I'm working on three novels. And they all have to do with emotional healing and deliverance. Yeah. And I'm going to, in the novels, portray how this process is worked out in, uh, in some average people. Wow. So... That's that sounds powerful. <laughs> it, 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 yes. it, it makes me remember that Jesus could easily have simply explained the keys to the kingdom to everyone. What I find fascinating, and, and 
why I think he often spoke in parables is because my understanding has grown to the point that with revelation comes responsibility. And a lot of people are not in that place where they can be responsible for direct revelation given to them. So I, I look at the kind of story you're talking about now where it, it could almost be presented in an allegory kind of fashion that it literally carries those <clears throat> keys of truth, but it allows Holy Spirit to begin to highlight and uh, pull out those keys for people uh, knowing where they're at in the process and when they're ready for it. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. Um, that is a key point in all of this. Um, what what I've found, and I think this is consistent with a lot of my friends who operate in emotional healing, these emotions and the traumatic memories many times will lie dormant in your soul until you are at a place in your life where you are ready to have them healed. I've heard this over and over again, and it, and it was true for me. <clears throat> I had uh, I had suffered some emotional trauma as a teenager, right. and all of those memories and 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 the emotions were kind of dormant in me for the better better part of forty years. Wow. Until I started to learn about emotional healing, I had some friends who understood emotional healing, and one friend in particular who was able to walk me through the process of getting this trauma healed. It was Matt. Matt Evans. Um, what happened was, and this is just a theory, I don't know if it's true, but I can't point to a place in the Bible where, it's, where it says this. And this is why it lends itself well to allegory. Because a lot of emotional healing, people will say, well, where, are the, where is that in the Bible? And I just had this girl just uh, today leave a comment on one of my threads about emotional healing. Show me in the Bible where it says that, you know, this and that and the other thing. And I was like, you know, look, I'm talking about a, a testimony of a person who went through this process and became a brand new person because of it. And if you can't accept that, that's fine. But uh, <clears throat> so what happened for me was I had um, this emotional trauma. I had the memories. I had the emotions. It all lay dormant until a couple of years ago where the, I think the Holy Spirit started to stir up these emotions. And right. he literally was triggering me. Now, <clears throat> some people may have a hard time understanding that. But <clears throat> there were a lot of people in Jerusalem and in Judea who wanted to be healed. They yes. needed healing. But it wasn't until Jesus came along where God sent his son into that part of the world where people came out and were ready to receive his ministry of healing and deliverance. Yeah. God stirred up their hearts in anticipation that, Hey, the Messiah is coming. When Jesus came, a lot of people were expecting the Messiah was coming. They had heard yeah. God had spoken to them and stirred them up and helped them understand, Hey, your deliverer has been born. He is living now. Go find him. So, this emotional healing thing is something like that. There's a lot of people now that are understanding more about emotional healing. And what okay. the Holy Spirit is doing is he's stirring up the emotions in us so that we will search for our healer. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened to me. Yeah. I started getting triggered, and I was having this anger come out all the time at work. I was angry all the time. I was spouting off. I was just in this rage over the littlest, tiniest, dumbest things were getting me angry. And I, this went on for a few months and I wondered, what is going on? Why am I overreacting? Why am I being triggered? Why am yeah. I so angry all the time? I'm not like this. This is not a big deal. I couldn't understand why I was reacting in anger. And what I know now is the Holy Spirit, I think, was stirring up this emotion in me and he was stirring up these wounded parts of my soul so that they would come up and I would recognize I need healing. 
call up my friend Matt. Hey Matt, I need emotional healing. You need to help me. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the emotions got stirred. I sought out help. I got healed. And that set me on my journey to understanding how this process works to help other people get healed. So it to me, it's I find it very interesting that the Holy Spirit, I think, will actually stir up emotions at a time when healing is available for you. I've found a lot of people who all this stuff remains dormant until right before they run into this Facebook discussion where all these people are talking about emotional healing. And then they jump in and go, hey, I've been noticing that I'm feeling all this anger or I'm feeling all this whatever emotion is. And I'm wondering if God will actually heal me. And that's exactly what's going on. God is stirring them up, bringing these emotions to the surface so that they will get involved uh, in the discussion and eventually get healed. Yeah. Now, I know for me, I think it's probably along the same vein. But uh, what, I, what I've been finding along the way for me personally is oftentimes... Uh, the very way Father tries to bring healing to us or to uh, make us aware that there are areas in our emotions that still need to be healed. My experience is it often comes in a similar package or a, a similar wrapping. In other words, if I have an issue uh if I've been wounded by authority, sometimes the very person carrying uh, that anointing, that healing I need that can help me through this part of the process comes in the wrapper of authority. Or I know for women, oftentimes, if they've been deeply wounded and abused by men, uh, oftentimes, there's an anointing carried by some, but the package may be similar. So it's always been my encouragement. Don't ever get uh, turned off by the package or the wrapper that you see on the outside, because very often the very gift and healing you need uh, is contained within it. I think there's some truth in that. Um, I, you know, I'm 55 years old, so I'm old enough to be a father to a lot of the women that are on Facebook that we're doing emotional healing with. And it's interesting that a lot of them were wounded by their fathers. And God is raising up people who these women can see sort of as like a spiritual father. Steve Harmon, when he does his emotional healing, he does a lot of essentially what is fathering. He nurtures these people and he shows them the kind of love that their father never showed them. Mm. He's acting as a surrogate father. I kind of do the same thing. I show these women who have been abused and wounded that there are men that you can trust who will show you what a good father is supposed to be like. Because as much as we can tell people, look, you can just go to Jesus and he can show you, you know, everything you need to know about God. Jesus sometimes needs to have skin on. <laughs> yeah. Some people need to see us being like God the Father. They need Absolutely. to see us representing Jesus the way he needs to be represented with skin on. So a, a lot of the um, ministry of emotional healing has to do with simply how we represent the Father and Jesus to these people. Because people who have suffered emotional trauma, they have been lied to. <laughs> are lied to by the demons, lied to by darkness, told bad things about Jesus, that Jesus is evil and he hates you and he's wicked and don't ever have anything to do with them. So yeah. we have kind of a responsibility of representing, re-representing, accurately representing who Jesus is and who the Father is. In fact, in a lot of uh, women and men who have been, who have multiple personalities, the, some of their personalities um, absolutely reject and will have nothing to do with Jesus. You can yeah. try to do an, a, an inner healing ministry with them and introduce them to Jesus. They won't have any, they will not have anything to do with Jesus because they have been told Jesus just horrible things about him. 
So yeah. if Jesus is the healer and they want nothing to do with him, then you have this question of how do you get that person healed? Well, Jesus will tell us, look, they're going to have to learn about me through you because they trust you, but they don't trust me. Yeah. So we have to tell this person, we have to disciple them and show them what Jesus really looks like. And there, <laughs> some, sometimes we're going to be the only Jesus they actually know until they let the wall down and then let the real Jesus in. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's where just building healthy relationship. Uh, that's a key part for Julie and I, we just, we are just, we want to reach out and get to know people and just build from there, you know? So whatever that looks like, uh, it, it, it's of course an interesting journey, uh, doing it online, of course, but, uh, as we know between one another, it is possible. And in some ways it just makes getting face to face together so much more rich. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, like, Absolutely. like when we, when we finally got to, uh, meet you at the gathering conference, that was, you know, that was uh, a special time. That it was, was for us too. That was I believe, incredible. Yeah, I know Julie has a question for you uh, along the vein of what we're talking about here. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you know if you have fractures or DID? I mean, other than like strong emotions, if you think you have it, if you don't know you have it, how do you find out? I have a couple of answers for that. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Let me hang on a second. Uh, right. So, I'm of the opinion that everybody has wounded parts in their soul. Mm -hmm. That's the easy answer. I have not run into anyone who has their life so together <laughs> that they don't have some wounded parts in their soul. Yeah. I think we all have some, you know, what I would call fragments, which are just small wounded parts of the soul. The difference between fragments and altars is difficult to define exactly, <clears throat> which hasn't, I'll explain what DID is in a minute, Sally. Yeah, good question. Or Sheila, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so DID is uh, an acronym for Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's a diagnosis for, that used to be called multiple personalities. And all that is is simply, uh, uh, generally it's a, it is a, when your soul has been compartmentalized into multiple personalities and you have what we call a core, which is the main part of your personality. And then you have alters, which are is a shortened version of alternate personalities. Mm -hmm. And you can have anywhere from two or three to uh, over a hundred different personalities. That's DID, that's dissociative identity disorder usually caused by severe emotional trauma, satanic ritual abuse, um, and things of that nature. So uh, a different but similar process occurs with minor emotional trauma. We have parts of our soul that are wounded, <clears throat> and those parts are sometimes called fragments. The difference between a fragment and an altar is really the completeness of the pers personality. Most, uh, and, and it, this emotional trauma occurs on a spectrum from very minor to very severe and everything in between. Yeah. And it is, like I said, it's difficult to pin down exactly what is a fragment and what is an altar. Um, altars are generally believed to have a fuller, more complete personality. They have distinct likes and dislikes. They have a name. They have a lot of the higher functions of your normal personality. They, they have, um, they will come and take over your your body and your personality, and they will go out and do things. They'll drive around. They'll have boyfriends and girlfriends. They'll get online and and they'll interact with people. They have a, a very fully developed personality. That's usually what we refer to as an alter. Okay. Now, a fragment is a part of your soul that has been wounded but it is less fully developed. Mostly it's children 
Many of them don't have names. Some do have names. Many only have a memory of one event and they can't remember anything else. And their whole, the whole purpose of a fragment is to hold on to the memories and emotions of a, of a traumatic event. So many times when you're dealing with a fragment, they'll only have a memory of one event and they'll only have the emotions that are attached to that event. And they don't have any perception outside the world what's going on. Okay. They live in this inner world and they're continually, persistently uh, dealing with this one event. For them, for that fragment, that part of your soul, it is the, <laughs> it's the only perception that they have. They are continually reliving this event. And that is one of the reasons why people have flashbacks. You have flashbacks, which is a recurrence of the memory of that event because an altar or fragment is being triggered and is coming up and taking over and you relive that event. I, my first wife had pretty significant emotional trauma. And when we were young and just dating, she would wake up in the middle of the night in a full blown flashback of a traumatic event that happened years ago. And yeah. I did not understand what was going on. I understand now, but I didn't understand then that she had suffered pretty severe emotional trauma. And she would have these flashbacks and she would just wake up and she was back in the event. She couldn't see me, she couldn't react to me. In her mind, she was seeing this attack on her that happened years earlier. So, and that gets into post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, yes. People who have post-traumatic stress disorder, what typically happens is they, they have these flashbacks and it's a trigger of a memory that is being held onto by an altar or a fragment, part of their soul. And it comes up, it takes over, it's projected in your mind, you see the event, you hear the voices, and it again, it's like you're, you're there because the part of your soul that was wounded at that time is coming up and taking over. And okay. that is why people have flashbacks. But again, all of this is healed through a very similar process where Jesus comes in and he meets the altar or the fragment. He talks to them. He asks them some questions, you know, what are, what are you doing for this person? What, what is your responsibility? What is, what pain, uh, what emotions do you feel? Uh, can I take those memories? Can I take the pain? And then he heals them of the pain, sometimes heals the memories. And then there is the question of integration. Sometimes he will merge that, that part of the soul back into the core. Sometimes he doesn't. Um, it's it's all whatever Jesus wants to do. Okay. Uh, does that Julie? Did that answer the question? I kind of went on a on a tangent yeah. there. Yeah, that's all right. all right. Um, so when someone has this, do you suggest them doing it themselves, or is there a point where they should seek help from somebody else? It depends. It depends a lot on how comfortable they are mm -hmm. with the trauma, how severe it is how well they're able to perceive in the spiritual world, how familiar they are with their own inner world, how familiar they are with the, <laughs> the children that are wounded inside of them, mm -hmm. how comfortable they are with getting rid of demons, uh, <laughs> how comfortable they are with working with Jesus in this mm -hmm. dynamic. So some people are, are unusually perceptive about their own inner world. Most of some of their altars and fragments will be familiar with Jesus and be okay with having him do this. Some mm -hmm. won't. Some people don't understand their inner world very well. They don't know who their, per, their personalities are. Some people are not all that comfortable with Jesus coming and ministering to them personally. Those people probably need help. They probably need someone to help them through the process and explain what's happening. Um, and it's, it's a gradual thing. Some people, uh, get, would get freaked out about having to, you know, get rid of demons. <laughs> so they would need someone to help them do that. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the person themselves and how comfortable they are doing it. I, I know quite a few people that I've worked with, uh, mostly through Facebook chat. I've shown them the process. We've gone through two or three events where we had different memories healed. And then they're like, okay, I got this. I can totally do this myself. And they get it. Yeah. Other people, they don't want to engage the process themselves. They want someone to help them through it. So it kind of depends on the person. Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, 
I think, uh, well, I'm gathering from what you're sharing, uh, I believe we're all at least fairly self-aware uh, with, the, the, with the things going on in our life. I, I know for me personally, because I had issues with my dad growing up, it carried over. And even long after I was in the kingdom, I discovered I still had issues with father. I mean, I literally got to the point I could trust Jesus. And I got to the point uh, where I was able to embrace Holy Spirit. But there was something about uh, my upbringing that affected my approach to the Father. Yep. And uh, clouded my ability to see him in his beauty and how good that he really is. So I know that one took me some time, but you you kind of become aware over time as you're walking out this journey that, hey, this doesn't make, why do I have an issue uh, when somebody presents the father to me? Right. You know, exactly. and it, and why do I feel fear? Different. Why do I feel anxiety when people talk about God the Father? Yeah, I was looking, my my outlook was that he just couldn't wait for me to mess up. <laughs> and boy, am I going to have hell to pay when right. daddy gets home. Right. You know, so I'm sure probably they can relate to that also. <laughs> uh, we've, we've posted on the screen that if anybody has any questions for Dave, uh, especially concerning uh, the present topic, then go ahead and type it in the comment section. Uh, I know Dave was looking forward. Uh, he expected there would be some questions. So, Hey, hey Brian. Yeah. I want to go back and, and answer a question that Julie asked that I didn't completely answer real quick. Okay, great. There are some symptoms that can tell you if you have emotional trauma. And like I said, it occurs on a spectrum from very minor to very severe. Some of the symptoms are, if you dissociate quite often. Now, dissociation, which is, which is the term in dissoci dis, uh, dissociative identity disorder, to dissociate is to essentially check out for a while from reality. Your awareness, your conscious awareness, goes somewhere other than what is happening right in front of you in the natural world. It can be anything on the spectrum from daydreaming to another personality coming up and taking over your body for days or weeks and everything in between. People who often or sometimes find themselves having driven somewhere, gone somewhere, done something, and have no memory of how they got there, mm -hmm. dissociation. Now, here's an example of minor dissociation. <clears throat> You're driving from Spokane to Seattle. It's a three or four hour drive. Okay. You remember getting on the freeway and starting to drive. You remember going past a couple of exits, and then you arrive in Seattle, and you're like, wow, I think I drove this whole time, and I don't really remember much of the drive. That is a minor form of dissociation. You're going somewhere. You're doing something, but you're really not aware of it. Mm -hmm. okay? okay? So on the very, very minor end of the spectrum, that's what dissociation looks like. Okay. Um, some people will go to parties and hang out with people. And they are conscious the whole time. But the next day, they'll have no memory of what happened. Okay. A blackout. Okay? Dissociation. People who suffer severe emotional trauma as children, uh, satanic ritual abuse and torture and things of that nature, many of them have no memories of their childhood up until the age of maybe 14, 15, 16 years old. Some of them have no memories of their childhood. If you have significant chunks of your lifetime where you have no memory of it, that's a good sign of dissociation and emotional trauma. Okay. Okay. So yeah. those types of things, if you notice those things in your, in your life, if you don't have a good memory of you know, what happened to you for 10 or 15 years of your life, good chance you have some degree of dissociation and you probably have some emotional trauma. 
If you have done things, said things, been places that someone else has told you about, and you have no memory of it, good chance you have some, some degree of dissociation and some kind of emotional trauma that's attached to that. Um, some people find it in dreams and visions. I've had dreams where God has shown me where I met some of my altars wow. in dreams. Whoa. <laughs> where there was two versions of me in the dream, and they were distinctly different. And what God was showing me in the dream was, this is an altar. It is a different part of you that needs to be healed. So wow. if, you're, if you pay attention to dreams and things of that nature, God will reveal to you that you have emotional trauma. Yeah. And I guess a, a key to that would be to look forward to and anticipate that Father wants to speak to us in the nighttime. Mm -hmm. yep. it, it would probably help. Uh, I did see an excellent question from uh, Jasmine Crystal Cinders. She's wondering, what if you need healing, but you don't have the flashbacks, or is it possible you're having them and you're not aware of them? Uh, what would your response be to that, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. typing in a response to Jacqueline, who answered a question, who asked a question, I don't have any memories uh, up until I was 12 years old. Okay, that's, yeah. that's classic. Oh, if you yeah. don't have memories of your childhood up until, you know, middle school or even elementary school, there's a good chance that you suffered some emotional trauma. And those memories are being held on to by the parts inside of your soul. What the Holy Spirit will do um, <laughs> while you're doing ministry, and there's, I'll just say this, there's a lot of different ways in which the Holy Spirit will do, deal with this. I was working with a friend of ours who had a pretty traumatic childhood. Okay. And she had a memory. Well, I, let me say it this way. She didn't have a memory of the event. She had an emotion that really bothered her. Okay. And, and she would feel this emotion and not know why she was feeling it. And I was, we were doing a emotional healing over Skype one day. And I said, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to show you the event, which she had no memory of. Okay? She saw in her mind a picture of her father molesting her, which she had no memory of until that moment. So we had Jesus take the memory, heal the emotion, and a few minutes later, she could look at that same image again of her father molesting her. She had no, when the first time she felt rage, shame, horror, and anger. So we had Jesus healed all the emotions. He healed the memory. He healed the emotions. And then she's able to see that same event a few minutes later. No shock, no anger, no shame, no horror. She said, I can look at it almost as if I was a, a third party or a, an objective observer. She said, I have no emotions involved in it at all. And that emotion never came back. So okay. if you're, if you have negative emotions, but you don't know what they're related to, sometimes the Holy Spirit will show you what that event is and he'll heal the emotions. Sometimes he'll just heal the emotion and you'll never know what the event was related to. But if you go, if you get connected to somebody who can walk you through the process and get healed of the emotions, you don't necessarily have to know what the memories are, what the events are. Some people are afraid of going through emotional healing because they don't want to relive the events in their mind. They know what the yeah. events are and they don't want to relive them. It's yeah. not always necessary to relive the events when you're going through emotional healing. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will give you a memory if it's necessary, and then he'll heal you of the emotion. So, you know, how the Lord does it, it is really does is different from person to person. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, where is that question that we had up there? Uh, someone was asking. Okay. No, we already did that one. Did we do that mm -hmm. one? Okay. I'm sorry. I got him on track. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's such an amazing uh, better half. <laughs> uh, Everyone needs to have a better half. <laughs> or a, diff a different half. <laughs> yeah. 
And I know Sheila was asking, how can we arrange to speak with David for help? And uh, I'm sure you hear that a lot. Perhaps prayingmedic.com would be a great yep. place to start. What, what I recommend, because I'm not able to do personal ministry with a lot of people, because I'm just, I'm insanely busy. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not the best at doing this. I am a good teacher. I'm a better teacher than I am a healer. There are people out there who are actually better at this than me. And they have, this is what they do all day long. They walk people through all this stuff. They understand it better than I do. Um, so I recommend, I refer a lot of people out to other ministries. Operation right. Light Force is one that I refer a lot of people to. Um, I, I trust the people that are doing that. I refer them out to Liebusters. Liebusters is pretty good. And I really like um, Freedom Encounters. The Thornburgs okay. run Freedom Encounters. And I've referred a lot. Diana Jamerson is on this video. Diana yes. Jamerson went to, to Freedom Encounters. She got set free of her issues, and they were really good. She wrote a testimony about it. I posted it on my website. I really do try to refer people out to other ministries because they're better at it. They have better knowledge. They have more time. They can get yeah. you completely cleaned up and set free of all the nonsense. And so, you know, it, it's not like I, I don't ever work with people individually, but it's it's rare because I have a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. um, that's That's just how I... My ministry works. Yeah. Um, but yeah, people can contact me through at through my Praying Medic website. They can go to the contact thing. I have a Frequently Asked Questions tab. If you go to the Frequently Asked Questions, the, I think the second one is, I need emotional healing or deliverance. What do I do? Yes. I have links to all the resources there in that answering that question where people can click on a link, go there, and request uh, personal ministry. And that's what I would yeah. recommend for most people. Now, I was just on there again today, and I noticed that uh, you do have uh, your materials available that yep. uh, it, in book form. Mm -hmm. uh, looks like you're beginning to get a lot more of your audio MP3, uh, that section built up, along yep. with numerous really uh, thought-provoking articles um, that would – uh, the, I know you deal with a lot of these topics, at least on a on a partial basis in blog form. Uh, Kathy has an interesting question for you. <laughs> she notices that she noticed a person praying for trauma on another prayer thread, and they bound a demon. Yep. And she, she didn't really feel well. You can see the question there in front yep, of you. I see the question. Uh, demons are involved in, uh, e emotional healing. And sometimes it is necessary to deal with demons. In fact, most of the time it's necessary. How you deal with those demons, again, is going to vary from person to person. Uh, some people are really aggressive on kicking out demons. Other people aren't. I, I don't do a whole lot of kicking out demons with people when I do uh, emotional healing because I tend to focus on the emotional trauma. I try okay. to get the altars and the fragments healed. I try to get the wounds healed. I try to get the emotions healed. And I try to, if Jesus wants to, heal the memories. Okay. Right. What that does is, and this is the analogy that I use. Some people are really big on kicking out demons. Okay. Imagine if you had a garbage pile in your backyard and you just kept throwing garbage in the garbage pile and never took care of it. And you have these rats come around and they're eating off the garbage pile. Well, you can go out there and shoo the rats away and they'll leave, but they'll come back. And you'll go out and shoo the rats away and they'll leave, but they'll come back. Because if you don't want the rats around, you have to get rid of the garbage pile, right? Right. You get that. Yeah. The reason why demons come and harass us is because we have emotional trauma. Emotional trauma, emotional wounds are the garbage pile that demons come and feed on. Yeah. Okay. The Apostle Paul said, 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil a foothold. Yeah. Anger is a foothold for the devil, for demons. It's an emotion. So Paul was saying, get rid of these negative emotions, get them healed, unless you want to leave doors open for the, for the devil. So what I found is if you heal up the emotional trauma, heal up the wounds, get rid of the negative emotions, it takes away the food that the demons are going to come and prey upon. Right. I pray for a lot of people for emotional healing, and it, it never surprises me. Someone's just say, oh, wow, I felt something lift off of me. I'm like, right, well, that was a demon leaving. Yeah. Uh, we got you healed of the anger. We got you healed of the shame or the guilt. And the demon that was attached to you that was feeding off of that is gone. I didn't, I rarely do I have to cast demons out of people because I go after the emotional wounds. If you heal the wounds, you close up the access point to the demons and the demons leave. So basically so, you're, you're saying that in your experience, you found that those emotional wounds and scars are the root. So if you deal with the root, the fruit takes care of itself. So in other exactly. words, when that healing comes, uh, then there's not that region for them to feed off of any longer right. or right. to uh, hold a place. Uh, yeah, that's that's my approach. But sometimes, you know, I have worked with people that have had to go after demons and sometimes take them to the court of accusation and find out what the legal rights are that that demon has to go after that person. And you deal with the legal rights, go to the court of accusation, and then, you know, hopefully get rid of the demon. Sometimes you do have to bind demons, tell them to shut up. You know, sometimes you have to kick them out. I'm not saying you never have to do it, but some people could probably do it less if they were dealing with the emotional wounds first. Okay. So I have another question. <laughs> Go figure. Sorry. So if you know somebody that seriously needs emotional healing yep. and they know Jesus, but they're not walking you know, close to God. How do you kindly suggest that? Or you just pray and leave them alone or. Um, oh. Yeah. Hard it, it, it's, it's friendship evangelism, mm -hmm. right? So you need to uh, have this person understand that you care about them. Yeah. And that you love them and that your purpose isn't to drive them to a point of view that your goal is to get them healed. Okay. And I, I do this with people. I just say, look, you know, just humor me. <laughs> just hit, let me try something. Here's what I want you to do. Uh, you know, this is going to be fun. Either it's going to be absolutely nothing or it's going to be something really cool. Why don't you just try this? So I walk them through this little process. And by the way, to answer the question that somebody had earlier, I do have a book on emotional healing. It's called Emotional Healing in Three Easy Steps. And you can get it on Amazon. It's in print and it's in Kindle. It's a very short, simple, easy book. I'd explain the process. You can, if, you're, if your emotional trauma is not severe, you can walk yourself through the process using the steps in the book. It's really easy. If your emotional trauma is more severe, you, you might need some help beyond that book. And, and I'm working on another book that's longer and more involved. I, I do appreciate the fact that you find uh, uh, it being a relational thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all uh, relational. It's it is. If you, if you know somebody who needs emotional healing, it's, it's relation. Just build a friendship with them, build some trust, and then say, hey, you know, some, if you're ever open to it, we can try this. And it's really simple. You just say, look, just repeat after me. Say what I say. And if they say the words, if they will say, look, Jesus, I want you to take this emotion. I want you to heal the wound in my soul. If they'll say that, Jesus will heal them. And then you go back and have them recall that memory, and they won't feel those emotions anymore. And then you'll, you can say, okay, well, what do you think just happened? Two minutes ago, you felt this anger when you thought of this memory, and now you feel nothing. You feel peace. How do you explain that? Yeah. And most of the people that I do it with, they're like, okay, well, maybe this Jesus thing is real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I know we've been speaking a lot 
uh, about emotional healing and it's obviously it's touching a lot of the audience in the present moment uh and at at the same time uh i know that you've been uh teaching and it's become a very popular series uh a variety of subjects on uh it's 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 not the computers for dummies because <laughs> we're we're not dealing with dummies we're we're dealing with fellow members in the body of Christ and you have found uh, and have published a series on making these things simple like divine healing make it, made simple or hearing God's voice made simple uh, and also another one that we've been on the subject, it seems like uh, pretty much all month, of seeing in the spirit. We had uh, Michael Van Vlyman on recently. And uh, what I find uh, really interesting is although the topics are different, every one of them are keys to uh circumnavigating of, of literally walking in the kingdom uh it, so uh what about for somebody who says you know i don't really see in the spirit you know and because you know it comes in a variety of ways for some seeing in the realm of the spirit is uh starts off with beginning to behold and see the kingdom and have kingdom encounters, even in the nighttime in your dreams. I, I know a lot of the stuff that you've learned and began to delve into have all been the results of dreams. Uh, what do you find are, are some of the really important king, keys uh, of the kingdom for those that are so so hungry for more, like a lot of our audience is. <laughs> I am going to bore your audience now <laughs> and tell them, I agree wholeheartedly with what Michael Van Vlyman said. <laughs> <laughs> because well, Michael is a really good teacher on mm -hmm. seeing in the spirit. And, you know, uh, Michael and I have a similar revelation and a similar approach to teaching on seeing in the spirit. It's do the stinking exercises. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Practice when you're at night, before you go to sleep, you know, look into the, into the space between you and the wall. And it's do these exercises and it's seek the kingdom. And it really comes down to doing the exercises. It comes down to look, you know, we all know people who have not been able to see visions. And we all know people who learned how to see visions by doing the exercises, by engaging the spiritual world. And the thing that I, I think <clears throat> is the most helpful is to understand that visions are not something spooky and weird. And visions for most people are not these great panoramic scenes that you see out in front of you like you know i saw wheels within wheels and i saw this burning mm -hmm. glowing you know like the son of man and these angels with six wings i mean that's out in front of you that is not how most people see visions that it's not when you, when you are seeing in the spirit you are seeing in the little tv screen in your mind okay mm -hmm. okay when i see visions only rarely does it appear to me what we call an external or an open-eyed vision. Most of okay. the times when I see visions, when God shows me something, it's in my mind. I see a picture in my mind. It's just like the picture, like if I, you know, so you ask me, hey, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? I get a picture in my mind of my little bowl of granola and, you know, the milk on it. That's That picture in my mind is the exact same thing I see when God is showing me a vision of the in the court of heaven or in wherever you know when i see angels or when he is showing me what's inside of a person's body that needs to be healed i see a picture in my mind that's all it is 
Okay. You know, if you can see pictures in your mind, you can see visions. You can see in the spirit. That's mm -hmm. where you see it. Um, it's not something weird and spooky, and it's not terribly uh, exciting most of the time. <laughs> so, you, some people just don't understand what it actually means to see in the spirit. We all have the ability to do it. We all have a spirit. Our spirit has spiritual eyes. Our spirit can perceive the spiritual world. Our spirit can see angels, see demons, see Jesus, and see anything in the supernatural world, in the spiritual world. Our spirit conveys what it sees to our brain through the little TV screen in our mind. That's yeah. how you see visions for most people. So if you understand that, what the next key is to realize that you're always seeing little images in your mind. You just need to understand Sometimes those little images in your mind are not your imagination. Sometimes mm -hmm. God is actually showing you something he wants you to pay attention to. Okay. So it, what I tell people is, is it's really more of an awareness thing. Hearing God's voice, you are, per, you are hearing thoughts that are not your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Seeing in the spirit is, is perceiving images in your mind that are not coming from your imagination. And there's a way to discern which is you and which one is God. Um, you know, I don't know if we have time to go into that tonight, but uh, it's seeing in the spirit is much less spooky and weird than most people think it is. Awesome. Awesome. And I like the analogy, you know, where you said, you, you know, it's just like if you ask me what I had for breakfast, you know, I can, I can immediately you know, picture, hey, there's my bowl of granola sitting there or, you know. Bacon. Yeah. Bacon. Oh, yes. Lots of bacon. Yes. And, and the only time I have to imagine bacon is when another 10-pound box is polished off right. and we haven't yet replaced it. Because <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole food group of its own around here. Uh, we do – I see a question from uh, – from Letty Sanchez, uh, back on the topic of, uh, in this case, uh, a form of anxiety on a young 13-year-old wondering yep. how she can help her son. Yeah, I saw that too. Um, anxiety, it's, it's been my experience that, generally speaking, panic attacks, anxiety, unexplained fear, things of that nature, it's, it's all demonic. And it is generally caused by unresolved, unhealed emotional trauma. It, 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 it is demons of fear and demons of anxiety that are trying to prey on our emotions. And they're bringing up memories and they're bringing up fears and they're bringing up scenarios. They're triggering these memories of things and they cause us to feel anxious, fearful. And so... The key to that is getting at the root, getting at, you know, what was the event that first made you feel this way? When did you first feel anxiety? When did you first feel the fear? Well, it was when I was, you know, five years old and my dad locked me in a closet. And how long were you in the closet? I don't know. It seemed like forever. And I was terrified and I thought I'd never get out of there. And I thought I was going to die. Okay, well, let's go back to that memory. <laughs> let's. Get the memory, get the, the fear and the anxiety healed. Have Jesus deal with the memory. That's the kind of thing that is at the root of most people who suffer uh, panic attacks and anxiety. Yes. Okay. Uh, somebody is asking, and I would even, I wish I would have thought to ask this one. <laughs> if your imagination is blocked or seems to be a blocked, uh, could the root of that thing be an emotional healing? Uh, Karen. Hey, Karen. Glad you're on here. Yeah, it Karen. could be. It could be. Um, I know people who have written to me after they read my book on seeing in the spirit. Okay. I think it was in chapter five. I wrote about how some people have shut down their imagination willingly because the things that they saw in their imagination, the things that they saw in the spirit, frightened them, freaked them out. Some people got into the occult. 
some people just uh, were able to see in the spirit. They saw demons, they saw crazy things, and they're like, I don't want to see any more of this stuff. I am not going to see any more of this. And they shut down their imagination because they were emotionally traumatized by what they saw. So it's possible there is a wounded child, part of your soul, that has be, been terrorized or frightened or angry at what we, what you saw in the spiritual world and until you have that child that part of your soul healed um, that child is going to be controlling that thing and not allow you to see in the spirit if you get that child healed of the trauma if you have them renounce and uh, their agreement that inner vow that they made that I am not gonna see this stuff anymore or not, I'm gonna see here's what happens when a Oh gosh, when a part of your soul, a fragment or an altar is formed, it is formed to protect you from abuse, trauma, scary, frightening things. That part of your soul then has a job. It has a purpose. It thinks that it is there to protect you the rest of your life from that thing happening again. So um, wounded parts of your soul will be vigilant and anytime you get into a situation similar to the event that caused them to be formed they will come up and they feel like they have to protect you from that happening again if you were molested by your father when you were five years old okay and you can't have uh intimate relationships with men because every time you do this fear this anxiety comes up and takes over and will not let you get close to a man. What that wounded child is doing is they think that they're protecting you from a threat. So what you need to do is get that part of your soul healed of the pain, possibly have Jesus deal with the memory, and then and that part of your soul will realize you have Jesus, you're an adult, you're going to take care of this. The, the part of your soul has to realize that threat is not there anymore and has to be okay with you experiencing the rest of your life without worrying about this threat. So going back to the question about seeing in the spirit that Karen asked, I had not actually thought about it in that context, but if somebody saw frightening, terrifying things when they were a child, like Blake Healy did, he was born you know, fully able to see in the spirit. You could have an altar or a fragment that is terrified of that stuff, that is shutting down your ability, your imagination to see those things. So wow. you may need to have those wounded parts of your soul healed so that your imagination can be opened up and you can see those things again. Because otherwise, wow. you have this part of your soul that thinks it has a duty to protect you from it. Yeah. That's a, that's a role. Karen, really that was a really good question, good question by the way. Question. Yeah, absolutely. We have a question from Sherry Darby. She thought this might sound silly. I don't think it does. She's wondering, do you need to be seen in the spirit before you can go to the courts of heaven? No, you don't. Um, I actually have gotten some testimonies from people who have pretty much said, I, I have never seen visions. I don't see in the spirit. But I was laying in bed one night, and the next thing I know, boom, my eyes were closed, boom, I was standing with Jesus, and we were in something that looked like a courtroom, and he was talking to me. And he was told me, he said, look, there's an accusation against you. Do you hear that voice? That's your accusation. What do you plead? These people have really just basically said, I don't see visions. I just had this thing happen. So for some people, they have gone to the court of heaven for the first time in a dream. Uh, for me, the first time I was sick and I was laying on my pillow and I just saw this little image in my mind that looked like a bookcase uh, with law books. And I asked the Lord in my mind, why am I seeing law books? And then the, the, what I saw in my mind kind of opened up and it looked like a courtroom. So uh, you don't have to be able to see in the spirit very well in order to go to the courts of heaven. Some people only hear what is going on in the courts of heaven as thoughts in their mind. If you okay. don't see in the spirit, you may hear it as thoughts. You may hear the judge. You may hear the, the, uh, the sentence or the decree, not guilty. 
You, I, I know people who have gone to the court of heaven simply because they felt accused. They just, okay, let me give you this testimony. I got an email from a woman a couple weeks ago. She read my blog post on going to the court of heaven, and she said, and I mentioned, sometimes the cue that you'll know you need to go to the court of heaven is feeling like someone is accusing you. And it can actually be a literal person who's accusing you, or it can feel, or it can be a demon that's accusing you. You just hear this voice that is accusing you of something. She says, as I was reading your blog post, I thought about <laughs> this woman who has been accusing me. And I was like, wow, I can't believe this. She went to sleep. And as she was going to sleep, the Lord took her into this experience in the court of heaven where there was a demon there, and the demon was accusing her of the same things that this woman was accusing her of. Wow. So she dealt with the accusation, and she got a judgment against the demon. But it was all triggered by her reading my blog post, and she just went to sleep, and boom, she, there she was in the courtroom. That's awesome. So yeah. you can, sometimes you just hear the accusation. Sometimes you'll hear the judge. You'll hear Jesus. You'll hear the, the demons. Sometimes you'll see it. Um, people can perceive the spiritual realm differently. Okay. Yeah, and I like the fact that you said that for this woman that you shared the testimony about, uh, literally what started that off or uh, opened up the atmosphere, the potential, was reading a blog post from you. That's one of the very reasons <laughs> we love to share testimonies. I know... Right. Julie, just hearing the testimonies uh, about the courts of heaven and stuff like that, I don't know if you're aware, but I think do you want to take a minute to share what your experience was. Yeah, yeah. I was just out watching the stars relaxing because I like looking at the sky and I nothing in my mind. And all of a sudden, bam, there I am in the courts. <laughs> <laughs> so, I wasn't That's thinking cool. about it. Was it going That's there? Cool. Jesus has got his arm around me, and there's three or four little demons at the next table, just rapid fire, just accusations. And Jesus has just got his arm around me, just kind of chuckling. And <laughs> But, yeah, I, I wrote about it on my uh, Facebook page. But it was incredible. I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't, you know, using my imagination. It just all of a sudden I was yep. in the chair, and then I was there and back again. I, yeah. I'm, I'm surprised sometimes at how God will just spontaneously show me something. Last mm -hmm. night after Denise and I went out to dinner, I was tired and I laid down in bed, closed my eyes, and boom, he gave me this vision uh, about political figures in Washington, D.C. I don't want to talk about it here on, on the video yeah. today, okay. but it's, it's, I periscoped about it this morning. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, sometimes the Lord will just give you this information. He'll just show you this thing. It's like, look, since you're just sitting here doing nothing, let me show you what's important right now. Yeah, <laughs> it was awesome. <clears throat> here's, here's an interesting question for you, Dave, from Jennifer DeRosa. Uh, when you see in the spirit, personally, is it color or black and white images? And going on to say she's seen not familiar people smiling at her in black yeah. and white? Um, everyone's spiritual vision is somewhat different. When I started to, now most of my life I'd never saw visions. I never saw in the spirit. I had to learn how to do it. It was a gradual process. I would sit in the ambulance literally for hours with my eyes closed while the Lord was showing me images in my mind. And at first they were two-dimensional. And at first they were just like flat pictures. They were color. Um, I pretty much always see in color most of the time, but everyone's different. Uh, I have actually had visions of my father, my, my earthly father in black and white. Um, I've seen some visions of him walking on the shore, shores of a lake in black and white. But as my spiritual vision progressed, the images I would see went from flat two-dimensional images to three-dimensional images. The colors, which were kind of dull, became more sharp. I started to see some translucent images. I saw three-dimensional images. I saw scenes superimposed on each other. The more you develop your spiritual vision, 
the more complex the scenes will be and the more your spirit and your mind will be able to connect what your spirit is actually seeing. It's a process of learning how to develop your vision. Um, the more you engage the spiritual realm, the more accurately you'll see things. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. Sorry, our dog's freaking out down here. Yeah, don't worry. It's, it's cool. <laughs> Not bothering me. I don't see any dog here. <laughs> Uh, can you see one in your mind? <laughs> uh, yes, I can. Strangely enough, God's sake. She God wanted. Sake. She wanted to uh, say thanks, Dave. Uh, I know this is really touching uh, a lot of chords in a lot of areas, uh, and actually, we've been trying to trim the program down to an hour. <laughs> yeah, I told Denise it was going to be an hour because yes. I have to make her dinner. But you okay. know, it's good if we go over. Okay. Well, we already are over, so we want to be noticed. mindful of your time. <laughs> uh, we would we would love to have you back on again because I mean, there's such big areas to touch on, and it's certainly striking the mark with so much of our viewing audience. So, as, as we're mindful of your time. Uh, I, I won't I won't stick you on camera and, and say, OK, are you going to promise to come back and touch on it? But at least consider it. We hope that you will. And uh, if if there is. Uh, you know, it, let me put it to you this way. We usually ask everyone when we have them on uh, if if they would just. Uh, speak a blessing or uh, release what Father has poured into them uh, to begin to pour into others. Uh, would you mind taking a moment to do that? I will take two moments because they're small. Okay. Um, <laughs> one moment is to answer your question. Yes, I will be happy to come back on uh, live at five. Yeah, yeah I, I, I like doing this. Thanks. This is fun. I like fun. teaching. Anytime I get an opportunity to teach, it's hard for me to say no. Awesome. Um, the other thing I would uh, do is I would like to um, release to anyone who's listening to this video or watching it the boldness to confront the lies that the enemy has been speaking to you. Yeah. That the Lord would give you boldness to draw closer to Jesus and not just the core of your personality who knows Jesus, but the wounded parts of your soul that do not know Jesus, that those parts of your soul would learn to trust him as God said, that you would love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all of your mind, all of your strength not just part of your soul, all of your soul, that any part of your soul, any altars or fragments that are afraid of the Father, that are afraid of Jesus, that they would surrender to his love, that they would know his love, the breadth and the depth and the height of his love, and that their memories and their trauma and their pain would be removed by his love. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And that you would prosper even as your whole soul prospers. Awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's so good. David, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You thank betcha. You. It's been rich. Uh, and it's to been say fun. the least. Uh, everybody knows David has a lot of materials uh, uh, that are available on his site, prayingmedic.com. And Amazon. Uh, yeah, Amazon is also a good place. Uh, if you want to reach us, uh, you can catch us online on Facebook or at ptmen at yahoo.com, which is if, for... Go ahead. If anyone has any questions, uh, they can, they're free to private message me too on Facebook. There you uh, go, guys. Uh -huh. You've heard it. <laughs> just just know he gets a lot of messages so 
yeah. uh, as you send them out, be patient. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he loves to do this, and I'm sure he'll get back to you. So we want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. Again, thank you, David. Tell Denise we send our love. We I will when she gets home. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I think okay. she's out shopping right now, getting some dinner, which I have to cook when she gets back. So there you go. Fun. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll give her uh, hugs and kisses for you guys. Okay. Hey, we appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for watching. Until we meet again, uh, we just bless you in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, whoa. <laughs> Oh, boy. Okay. okay. So, hey, Father, right now in Jesus' name, even as you're pouring out your spirit in manifest ways over here, we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to touch each and every one in the same way. Uh, we just delight in the fact that you delight over them and that you want to show them areas that you want to bring healing and victory uh, in a new way of seeing things mm -hmm. through the Father's eyes into each and every life. We just thank you that you're so good at what you do. And we just trust you to kiss them and lavish you, lavish each and every one in the delight of your love. In Jesus' name. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks again, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Hey, thanks, everyone. Catch you later. Bye now. Good night.